chicken. I'm your guy. Lincoln. I'll have what Joseph has. Look, somebody's talking about you. This is what we call the voice of God. Mm. Popping. Everybody just gets to focus on you. Grab me. Probably not the best thing for an introvert. I'm asking for you. Well, I like a good chicken sandwich. Touch me. Hi, David. Comment. Oh my God. Like. You're actually an identical twin. Push. Maybe I'll just ask Julie to talk about what it is to no. be an identical twin. Pick me up. No, you did it. Shouting. Surprise. I Jeremiah, just hang on a second. I just got a text. There's an edit for your new opening, Joseph. I, I feel really honored to have been here, man. You. But by, by the way, you've done a masterful job. Seriously. It was such a joy. Thanks, Joseph. It's an honor. Good on you. This was a pleasure. I mean, you are a, the a prime example of how to pivot in this new environment. I wish everybody gets an opportunity to interact with Joseph Jaffe and Corona TV. Who needs cameo when I've got my own <laughs> personal cameo? <laughs> February 18th, and you are in for a treat. I am Linktree slash Jaffe Juice. Wait a second. I am Joseph Jaffe. I am your host on Corona TV. And are you ready to take off into the stratosphere with cumulative advantage? There is more to cumulative advantage than meets the eye. There is more, there's more to Mark W. Schaefer than meets the eye. He's back for a repeat appearance, back to back, Lodro yesterday, Mark today. And you're going to find out, um, as I said, you know, when you go into the rabbit hole, and it is a rabbit hole of cumulative advantage. Um, you are gonna you you're gonna get an unfair advantage, an unfair advantage. Remember that phrase. And Bowman says, "Let's go." You are right. Let's go. Uh, I mean, you know, Mark Schaefer is the final word of most of my show intros. You know, uh, the combination of being a laptop sticker. I wonder if he has become a laptop sticker yet. Um, and uh, and what surprises I have in store for him today. So let's get on with the show. Today is National Drink Wine Day. And I, uh, first of all, I don't drink white wine. I don't really like it. Uh, but when I do, I like to drink a nice glass of Cabernet Sauvignon. The problem, of course, is it is snowing outside here in the Northeast. And I'm down to my final few sips. Uh, so will I brave the uh, outdoors and the snow or... Uh, will I be resourceful? I will report back to you tomorrow and let you know what transpires. But enough about wine. Uh, let's talk about Mark Schaefer. Mark Schaefer is the author of Cumulative Advantage. I believe he's written nine books. Is this the ninth uh, or the tenth? Uh, we will find out soon enough. Um, and uh, one thing to just let you know, and I will mention it a few times, right after today's show, uh, we're going to actually do the after show on Clubhouse. So if you're on the fence, you've been in Clubhouse, you haven't figured it out, um, we're going to actually put the use case to work, right? The use case of being able to do a show, live streaming video, and then apply an audio-only version of an after show. Uh, there is a strategic reason for doing it. I'm happy to explain what that is later or even on Clubhouse. Uh, but come join us then. And by the way, for our regulars who are on Zoom, we're still going to be on Zoom um, so we can actually see each other. So we can hear each other, but definitely we can see uh, each other as well. So that is what you have to look forward to. Let's do birthdays quickly. Uh, who is uh, who is having a birthday? Michael Sisons is having a birthday. Uh, Carl McGuffin, uh, Robert Ricci, Stephanie Fireman. And then on LinkedIn, uh, there's Stefan Siegler, Jeff Bell, uh, Andres Laszlo and David Pierpont. Happy birthday to all of you. Hopefully you are having a good day. And uh, and I do want to just say for those of you that are in Texas uh, and in uh, several of the states, you know, first of all, obviously this is a global uh, audience, uh, but for those of you in the US and those of you in Texas and other uh, states that are suffering right now, uh, freakish weather conditions, lack or loss of power um, and, and freezing temperatures, we are sending warm vibes to you, massive, massive warm vibes to you right now. Well, today's seated soliloquy I'm calling uh, unfair advantage. And it's not often, you know, normally I write the seated soliloquy that is connected to my guest. But I thought I would actually write an entire soliloquy associated with, you know, what I took away or my perception or some of the 
uh, insights or maybe connections that I took away uh, from Mark's new book. Well, you know, cumulative advantage, which is the majority of what we'll be talking about today on the show, is my good friend Mark Schaefer's newly released book. And as I mentioned earlier, there is a lot more to this book and the subject matter than meets the eye. Now, Mark is not naturally a provocateur. Uh, he is a thoughtful man. He is considered. He is super smart. So basically, he's the opposite of me. But that said, if by going there, he touches an exposed nerve, then he will go there and do what has to be done because he is a truth teller. So when he says content strategy is not enough, social media isn't enough, SEO isn't enough. By the way, that probably eliminates about 180 of my 205 guests to date. Well, what I did is I immediately thought of my advice that I give startups and founders, entrepreneurs. I say to them, your success depends on four factors. Two you can control, two you cannot. What you can control is the idea and the execution of that idea. But what you cannot control is timing and luck. Oh, and by the way, Mark says luck isn't enough either. Damn it. Uh, the only thing that therefore remains is timing. But I want to use Mark's rubric, his filter, his overlay, if you will. I think maybe I need to reframe timing because it's really about what I would call extended timing or to use another word, momentum. So do you want it in even less jargon with a hat tip there to Ann Janza? How about this? When you get out in front, stay there. The odds are on your side. Why? Because people are lazy. The path to least resistance resides above the fold, at least when search results are concerned. Our entire being is designed to reduce that which is complex to that which we can count on our 10 fingers. In fact, here are the top 10 reasons why that works. That was a joke, by the way. In a world where marketing has been built upon a foundation of differentiation and competitive advantage, it's time to shake that foundation to the ground. Cumulative advantage is the dynamic to competitive advantages static. Whereas the theory of cumulative advantage is grounded in some troubling historical challenges and reality, there is an equal and opposite counterbalance that should reassure us all. Talent plus hard work plus consistency pays off, but you still need an X factor, which could be as simple as this. When you see an opening, go for it, and when you get your nose out in front, keep it there at all costs. In a world where everyone will get their 15 streams, clubs, or sea shanty songs of fame, the winners will be those who don't just gain an advantage, but press and extend that momentum into an unfair advantage called cumulative advantage. And now it's time to bring on the uh, master of, the, the creator of the book on cumulative advantage. Mark Schaefer is a marketing consultant. Uh, oh, and again, just to mention, as I was saying, uh, the after show will be on Clubhouse. But let's get back to the man and the story at hand. Mark Schaefer is a marketing consultant, keynote speaker, college educator, author of nine books, rather than give you a whole long rigmarole of a bio, because if you don't know who Mark Schaefer is by now, uh, what rock have you been hiding under? Let me just show you the story of Cumulative Advantage. Today, there's really only one priority for anyone who wants to build a business, launch a career, or just get an idea out into the world. You must be found. You must be heard. But as the amount of information explodes all around us, standing out seems impossible. In this era of infinite media, how will you be heard? Content isn't enough. Social media isn't enough. SEO isn't enough. 
Even being smart and hardworking and passionate are not enough. Does it seem like the odds are hopelessly stacked against you? Do you have to be rich, connected, and lucky to make a dent in this world? The answer is no. Cumulative Advantage takes you through the five factors that you can apply to your ideas, business, and life today. Finding an initial advantage. Applying it to a seam of opportunity. A sonic boom of awareness. Strategic mentoring and constancy of purpose. Cumulative advantage. The essential book for anyone with a dream ready to take flight. White as it fades to black. <laughs> My friend, the your, your seated soliloquy was poetry. It really, it was so beautiful. Well, well done. I'm going to have that transcribed. I'm going to turn that into a blog post. It this it, it describes my book better than I ever could. Thank you for the work you put into that. Oh, you're welcome. I was actually quite inspired. And the funny thing was, um, uh, and for those of you that don't know, Mark very kindly uh, sent me a copy of the book, but it didn't arrive because of all this inclement weather. So what I did was I started to dig around and I looked at a few at a few things at a high level. And without actually seeing the word, in fact, in fact, the soliloquy was going to be called momentum. That was what connected with me, momentum. And I always try and find new ideas, new thoughts that, that you know, 200 guests haven't discussed. And it's funny because momentum is a word that you use um, as well. And by the way, I pulled most of the connection even just from that, that beautifully produced video uh, of yours. But momentum is such a great idea right now. We could probably have an entire show and conversation today just on the thought of momentum. But of course, it's more than that. And we'll get back to that. But first, you know, Mark, you were guest number 37 on the show. You were, I didn't, I didn't even know what the show was. I, I, I'm i actually, I would cringe to even watch that show and see what has happened and what has changed and hopefully how much I've grown. But, you know, one of the things I started doing was this thing called Fun Facts and where I basically get to kind of, uh, Let's just use the word embarrass uh, my guest. Um, and so I I love this because, A, I find out things about my friends and my guests that I didn't know. Uh, but also it's amazing how they spawn additional insights and conversation. So without further ado, how many of you knew that Mark Schaefer is a bee maker? I mean, we know that honey comes out of his mouth but he actually has bees that make honey that won a blue ribbon at the state fair. So there you go. You are, you are, you, even the yellow of cumulative advantage, there's just honey all around us, sweetness. <laughs> what else can you tell me about, about, have you, how many times have you been stung by your bees? Zero. They're actually really, they're really very docile. Um, you, you could see this, uh, this panel that you have right here, which is actually the way the, the, the panels go into the hive, you can actually put your bare hand on the bees and they won't do anything. They're they're very, very docile, my honeybees, and they only get angry as if you would like tip over their hive or something like that. So I do it really mostly for environmental reasons because we're sort of in a bee crisis right now and I've got some land I can do something with. So we got these bees and then the, the fellow, uh, he's like a, county extension agent sort of guy and i didn't even know he entered the honey but he took the honey and entered it in the fair and i'll be darned if we didn't win that, that's amazing i mean so and by the way um i'm looking i'm looking at uh the comments and before we even go forward uh i have to say that you know tom says watching the show every day is a cumulative advantage it is um, and uh and also uh it is his wife's birthday but he has still decided uh, to watch the show today and you, Mark. So we just want to yeah. say happy birthday to Mrs. Morris uh, and thank you for putting up with him for as long as you have. Um, so I would have been remiss had, had I not done that. 
Here's another fun fact about you, Mr. Mark Schaefer. Uh, you are an artist. Again, we knew that. We, we've seen the art in the way you write, uh, but you've also been just like Howard Stern, I guess, doing watercolor paintings and, and, and you've even sold one of them as well. So now you are, you know, we should add professional artists to all, yeah. you know, to Soul educator, friend. writer, et cetera. Yeah, there, because I'm, I, I, it's become a very relaxing hobby for me and the paintings are starting to build up. So one of the things I'm thinking about for 2020, people have offered to buy these things. I'm thinking maybe there's a way I can like auction these off for like social good or something. And so I need to put that together in my mind how I, you know, I look, there's, it's this talent that kind of emerged and how can I use that to sort of like do some little good in the world right now? That's, that's one of the things I want to do for 2020. And, and 21, you mean? 2021. See, 2020. No, I just, Slide my brain permanently. You, you know, well, listen, I mean, for those of you that don't know, uh, um, Mark had COVID um, in, in 2020. And um, it was early enough that when you turned to Facebook um, and you started to share your journey and your struggle, your you know, um, it, it connected with so many people. And it was at a time when there weren't enough stories when when you were still seeing those ridiculous posts right which is do you know anyone who has covid do you know anyone who has died from covid and you were like it is real it is happening um and 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 you struggled with how are you feeling now because you've had you know we've had all of these long haulers are you 100 percent again uh, i i pretty much am uh, i did have a strange sort of after effect uh, the, the the short story is that <clears throat> the surge of antibodies that came from battling the disease triggered another disease uh, a few weeks after i was better i had fevers again and started getting sick and it it, it triggered uh, celiac disease in me and so it was misdiagnosed i had it but the blood test came back negative when it was supposed to be positive and so I had all this nausea. So I was eating bland things like pasta and bread. So I was literally killing myself <laughs> for months until they said, we think you have it. They did this genetic test. I've changed my diet and I feel like a new man. Well, I'm, I'm glad you are back. Uh, we, we, need, we need the jetpack to be firing on all cylinders. Uh, <laughs> and that is what is behind you as well. By the way, Tom said, put the paintings on a website so we can see them. Um, I, I have a feeling, you know, from an experiential standpoint, um, you know, it, it might be, it might be buy one watercolor, get, you know, get a signed copy of the book. It might be buy a thousand copies of the book, get a watercolor. Um, yeah. It can probably work both ways. But Mark, let's talk about, so is this book number nine or 10? Nine. So th that that's incredible. I mean, I've, I've written five and I think what people don't realize is that is that in some cases you can actually it's so much easier to write the first book than it is to write the fifth than it is to write the tenth or the opposite can occur where it just you get into a groove uh, how's it been for you do you find that it's getting easier and 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 the whole you know the whole bar is lower for you or do you find that it, it actually is more challenging as you keep writing in in one way it's harder and in one way it's easier it's easier because I have confidence that I can do it and I have a pretty good process for writing a book efficiently. It's more difficult because when I write a book, there is only one possible goal. It has to be better than my last book. And the, the books that I've written have become so beloved and I just feel so humbled by what they mean to people, known and marketing rebellion and content code. And it's like, I have one idea in my head. Every moment I'm writing the book, I will never let you down. I have individual faces in my mind. I know of people who read my books. And so there's a lot of pressure I put on myself and it becomes really an obsession and an unhealthy one um, that takes quite a toll on me to make a book that's that's original and bold and beautiful and 
most importantly, something that will help people in this moment? So when you talk about this idea of I will never let you down, for me, uh, it is quite appropriate because I had Anne Janza on the show and, and, and she practices servant authorship. To me, yeah, yeah. I will never let you down is the epitome of servant authorship that, that you know, the, it, it, is, it is super empathy, which is not how much time did I put into this book, not, you, you know, you paid 19 bucks on Amazon for that book and still you give me a four star review. It, it, it's, it puts all of that, you know, noise aside and focuses on this idea of being able to make a connection at the deepest level with an individual, with every single individual reader. And, and I, and I got to say, like, I had never even considered that until this week with her and then talking to you just now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there was, there was something that, that, that just moved me and had such a profound impact on me that, um, when Marking Rebellion came out, before it even came out, there was a professor at Northwestern University who assigned it to his business class as a text before he even read it. He said, I saw what it was about. I knew it was you. I have faith in you. And even today, people are buying 15, 20 copies for their teams of this book before they even re re read it. To me, I just can't take that ever for granted that when you get one of my books, there's no fluff, there's insights and ideas and inspirations on every page, and it's going to be well-researched, and it's going to be take it to the bank sort of insight and advice, and that's that's why it was so hard to write this book, because, you know, it's just a struggle, <laughs> and I had a lot of beta readers and something something interesting. Here's a fun fact about this book. I, you and I didn't talk about this. I, and, and, you'll, and you'll know why, because you've seen the book. I, I hired a sensitivity reader for this book. First time I've ever done that, because as you know, I get into some, some pretty dicey subjects in this book. And I, and, you know, I, I feel like I'm a pretty insulated middle-aged white guy sometimes. And, and you know, I, I wanted to represent this, this, these ideas in this book in a way that's really fair and balanced and, and sensitive to to you know parts of the world that I'm I might not be in touch with, and that so that was a great experience by the way, uh, first time I've ever done that. So so wow, I've, so I've never actually heard of a sensi sensitivity reader. Yeah, it, for I, I, so there, I, there are obvious ones, right? There are obvious ones in terms of being able to uh, probably display, um, you know, am I treating this the right way? Uh, yeah. Am I using the right terms or terminology? Maybe what was one thing that uh, surprised you it, pleasantly or un unpleasantly, I suppose, in terms of saying, I thought I was doing X, but in fact, I was doing Y? Well, uh, overall, the, I mean, I was validated. Uh, um, the, the woman that I hired is is really... Uh, she's a civil rights activist, a uh, community activist, uh, a, a teacher, and she's also a poet. So she appreciates good writing and is a good writer herself. And um, uh, so there was not, I was, I was validated because there, there wasn't really anything egregious, I would say, that, that, that was, I did you know, blatantly in the book, but she was able to sort of coach me in different areas, like saying, look at this page, you've got bullet, 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 bullet. Don't you think you could be more representative in that section? Couldn't you work a little harder and be a little more representative in that section? Yeah, And it's something in the back of my mind, I knew I should have done it anyway. So it, it was just, uh, it was a good learning experience. And it was a, it was a, very validating experience too. So there's there's an interesting insight there, right? Which is your spidey sense. You know, when, yes. when, you know, if you feel you could do more, then then you could do more, right? So it's almost like, um, you you know, it's like when somebody says, "Is it okay if I swear?" You probably shouldn't. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like one of those things when when you have to ask, then yeah. then then you probably know the answer, but. But but that was really interesting. And now 
you know, let's get into the con the I don't want to say controversy, but the this un as I was reading this, I was like, what? Wait a wait a second, what's going on here? So it brings up what's called, uh, and this is what this was my own rabbit hole, something called the Matthew effect, which basically says the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, you know, deal with it, right? Get over it. This is the way of the world, you know, that the people that are advantaged and out in front um, not only continue to realize the benefits of doing so, but have an unfair advantage in the process. And there are so many different analogies, but I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to put it out there and just say, how did you address this, this, you know, um, uh, I'm going to say, how about a how about a hornet's nest? To use the bee analogy, how did you approach it? Because I knew that whatever you did, you would do it in a thoughtful way and turn it on its head. Yeah. So let's, if I could just back up a little bit on on where this whole thing came from, and because it, it really addresses how I then uh, approached it. This this whole idea, it, it's not just a saying. Um, it's, it's backed up by very deep sociological research that started 50 years ago. And I, I think the story in the book of the man who did this, a, a very famous sociologist named Robert Merton, um, you and I have never heard of him because how many famous sociologists could any of us name? But in his field, he was very famous. And here's the thing that just obsessed me. He proved, and, and, and subsequent academics and researchers have proved, that if you get this small advantage, it grows and grows and grows and grows, and you, and you widen this gap, and it's unstoppable momentum unless there are countervailing processes. But he didn't tell us what they were. <laughs> and that was my obsession. And here's how obsessed I was. The man's son is still alive. Uh, and and it, this was so ironic. He did his fundamental research on Nobel Prize winners. How did they get there? And how did they keep this momentum going after they got there? Now, so I called his son, who is a Nobel Prize winner. <laughs> he learned this from his dad, right? <laughs> wow. So uh, Robert Merton himself was a poor Jewish immigrant settled in South Philadelphia and really was self-taught. He just, starting at five years old, he walked, five years old, walked to the Carnegie Library and read every day because his, his schooling was kind of off and on. So I, ca I called his son. I said, I'm writing this book. It's, it's about your dad. And I ha just have to know. He taunts us with this concept of countervailing processes. What were they? He said, well, I'm not the person to ask. You need to ask my stepmother. He was her researcher, his researcher for this project. So I contacted her. She's a professor at Columbia University. This, by and the way, I, feels like a Monty Python skit, you know, which is like, oh, you're going to have to go. Yeah. And so finally we did this exchange and she, and she was very, very kind and very, very generous and, and supportive. But long story short, a lot of these countervailing processes are just up in this if ephemeral academic air, and I had to bring them down, crack the code and bring it down into how do you, you know, if you don't have these built in advantages of wealth, connections, uh, you know, fame, a Harvard education or something, how do, how can you build this momentum on your own? And so I did get some guidance from the research, but a lot of it, I just had to sort of figure out on my own. And I, and I did some original research as well. I, I do feel, by the way, this it almost feels like uh, I said Monty Python, but maybe a better analogy would be City Slickers, where I say to Curly, "Well, well, what's the answer? What is what is the one thing? Oh, that's what you have to find out. You know, right. buy the, and it's not even by the book. It's 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 the secret of life. L yeah. Let me let me give you a couple of examples of as I went down my own uh, rabbit hole uh, of of cumulative advantage in practice. Uh, the first one is, is actually monopoly. Um, and, and it's very interesting because 
what happens with Monopoly, which, by the way, is one of the most frustrating games ever created, is everybody starts off uh, equal, but once the advantage sets in, it, it, it's it's almost insurmountable. Um, and so, and that obviously is before, I guess, those countervailing processes get put into play. But here's another example. I don't know if, and you tell me if this is in the book, and if it isn't, Hopefully, I can surprise you with an example, which is, had, did you read the article, which is, is Justin Timberlake an example of cumulative advantage? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That research is in the book. So this one, so so why don't you tell people what, what I'm referring to when I ask the question, is JT an example of cumulative advantage? Yeah, so this this is one of the most fascinating stories in in the book, especially if you're a business owner or uh, in marketing at all. So these the people who wrote this article that you're referring to uh, were researchers. And what they did is they created a fake website called Music Lab. And they I think they had 42 different songs. And people could go in, listen to these songs, rate the songs, and download for free their favorite songs. Well, after the first 7,000 visitors, the best songs on the site were clear. No question about it. Here are the best, highest quality songs. Now, here's what they did. For the, they, for the next 7,000 people that came onto the site, they flipped the ratings. So they thought the worst songs were the best songs. They flipped the social validation, the social proof. They made the worst songs have the best reviews. Complete flip. The next 7,000 people rated most of the worst songs as the best songs. And over time, they showed that the highest quality songs only had a 50% chance of making it anywhere near the top. This idea of the input of others, social proof, reviews, testimonies, overwhelmed quality. And so, and this is a big mistake that a lot of people make, especially in marketing, that we assume people make individual decisions. They rarely do, especially if it's a high value purchase. They, they look at reviews, they talk to other people, and that input is even more important than the product that they buy. So now, if you if you if you guys out there have ever listened to the top forty countdown, and and I don't want to necessarily, I'm I'm gonna I'm just gonna mention Britney Spears and say, well, her voice isn't that good, or this doesn't sound like great writing, or is she really as talented as? you know, as her success and the number of, of albums or or sales uh, would, would imply, uh, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. She maybe isn't as talented as, quite frankly, relatively speaking, a whole bunch of people that are waiting tables and, 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 and side hustling on, a, on the side, you know, on their side hustle to the side hustle who actually are more talented. And that gets back to the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. You know, as, as you're speaking, I, I made a connection that I never thought of before. It's very similar to Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point that, you know, he showed that if you sort of get the, uh, a critical mass of the cool kids involved, it can influence uh, in, in this ir almost irrationally powerful way the success of a product. And uh, so I, so I think that, you know, Malcolm is one of my writing heroes, probably my greatest writing hero. And I love all of his books, but I just, I just made that connection as you were speaking that this idea of momentum really connects to some of his observations about you, the tipping point. You, you're about to uh, launch into another, look at you, look at you, because, uh, because wh who said this quote, Mr. Mark Schaefer, success is the result of what sociologists like to call a cumulative advantage? Probably Malcolm. And the answer would be? 
Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah. And, and this, by the way, was in Outliers, but that's why yeah. I actually used the tipping point uh, in, in the blurb about today's episode as well, because that was the connection. And, and I will see your connection and raise you one more connection, which is, you know, there, there is this documentary out at the moment called Fake Famous. We're living in a world now, this land grab of how many followers can you account uh, and land uh, in Clubhouse and the like. And we see what's really happening here is that even influence and influencer marketing is absolutely now affected by this um, this you know phenomenon. Yes, and 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 it's and it's troubling, but again, what we need are those countervailing. What do you call them? Countervailing, countervailing processes. processes. Um, so let's talk about them. What are these? Because because I, I guess there are like about three different questions that I would ask you, and 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 I guess you can figure out how to weave it together. One is, is what are these countervailing processes and how can you almost, uh, the antidote, how can you, how can you counterbalance and bring and, and, and equalize, level the playing fields? The other one is what do you do if you don't have the, you know, the fame, the fortune, the wealth, et cetera, how do you comp compete on a level playing field? Um, so why don't we start, why don't we start there and then we can, and then we can kind of move forward. Yes. Well, so there, you know, there is a lot of research, uh, sort of scattered all over the place that I was able to bring together into kind of a comprehensive view of how this really works for real people in the real world. There was an inspirational uh, sort of rabbit hole I went down, where uh, Bloomberg keeps a list of the richest people in the world. Of the 100 richest people in the world, 10 of them, you could say, had no initial advantage. They came from poverty. They didn't have a college education. And they're one of the 100 richest people in the world. And they all did the same thing. So you see these patterns. And the pattern really begins, step one is an, is an, an initial advantage. What is that thing that can grow into momentum? And here's the thing. That uh, here's a promise for me to everyone watching and listening today. When you read this book, I don't think you will ever see the world the same way again. You're going to see this book, the, the world through this lens of patterns. When you meet people who are successful, you're going to listen for these patterns. How did it work? So it starts with initial advantage. Here's the thing that's amazing. I refer uh, I'm sure, Joseph, you've heard of this researcher, Franz Johansson. He wrote this amazing book called Click Moments. And what he was able to show with very compelling research that almost every successful person, almost every successful company begins through a random event. It wasn't a plan. It wasn't a strategy. They were in the right place at the right time. They were inspired by a friend. Someone asked them a question that got them thinking a new way. They observed something in a new city. They saw something that was wrong and they thought, why can't it go a different way? Then they pursued that curiosity and that creates this initial advantage. So step two is you have to then figure out how does this apply in a meaningful way to the world? And, and, and I have this really interesting section about how strategy is different today. I compare the classic Michael Porter view of strategy with how it really works today. And, and it's, it's like an American football team where you have two teams literally face to face against each other, strength to strength. And the, the coaches are in a, in a booth above the field looking for a weakness, a vulnerability, a seam. Where, where is, there, is, there, is there someone on the other, other team who's overmatched? Are they tired? Are they misplaced? Can we blow that open and run as fast as we can, as long as we can, to have an opportunity? That is what a seam is. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a combination of, of speed and time and space. 
and bursting, once you have that idea, you burst through and see, or are, the, are there enough people there that are interested in it? Now, and, and, and one of the other things I'll mention is that a seam can be a fracture in the status quo. I predicted last March there would be more startups in America than any other time in American history. And there were. There are more new businesses now than all these businesses that have failed because of the pandemic. Why? Because we have more underserved and unmet needs than ever. We have a fracture in the status quo. This show is taking advantage of a fracture in the status quo. You have found a seam because it's a certain type of show for a certain period of time with a certain audience that just, it could have never existed in history until now. And you're bursting through. Now, what comes next? This is something you and I talked a little bit about, you know, off camera, is this eye of awareness. That's the next step for you, really. You had this initial advantage. You burst through a seam. You are putting everything you've got into it. Now, we have to create this thing which I call uh, the sonic boom. And I've got this chapter that looks at new research about how things really go viral in our world. And it's not like you think. It's not like one friend tells another friend. It, there, there's a different science, a different dynamic behind this. And I think this will be the first time a lot of people really think about creating this massive awareness in this, in this new way. Once you create this awareness, one of the most powerful things you can do then is get help from someone who can help you. And in, in this section of this book, the strategic mentoring, which I call reaching out and reaching up, I think the traditional view of mentoring, which is here's someone who teaches me something new over a long sort of relationship is outdated. Today, to create these sparks of advantage, we need an opportunity. We need someone to open a door. We need someone to tell someone else about us. And so there's a science behind this. And of all these ideas around momentum, this can be one of the most powerful ones. Just the help of one person can change everything. And at the end of the book, I get into this very personal section about how this book had a profound impact on me and my view of the world. And I talk about the power of not just reaching up and reaching out, but reaching down, sending the elevator down. If these sparks of initial advantage can create momentum for other people, maybe people that have cumul cumulative disadvantage, isn't that something doable? Something we can all do is give someone else a chance someone that deserves a chance, open a door, make an introduction. That is accessible. That is doable. Then the fifth part is this idea of constancy of purpose, making good decisions to keep the momentum going. Uh, Jim Collins talks about uh, this, this uh, challenge of getting into the doom loop. The doom loop in every if we're trying to launch a movement, an idea, a nonprofit, a new business, a speaking career, at some point we face a crisis and the doom loop is when you forget what you're doing and you start reaching for anything to, to, to scramble and pivot and, and you lose sight of what your initial advantage was that's going to create that momentum going forward. So you have to make good decisions, consistent decisions, Avoid the doom loop. Remember, you know, what, what got you there. And, and uh, the last part is constancy of purpose. So those are really the five things backed up with a lot of research, a lot of inspiring stories in there about people who literally just started with nothing that were able to create this momentum and uh, really accomplish amazing things. So you, you very, uh, you, you very kindly um, started to talk about what I've been doing with Corona TV uh, over almost 11 months now. And, um, and it's interesting because, because but be, be, I want to go back to that and just quickly work through these five factors. 
But something that struck me in in the beginning, as you said, this is a personal, it's almost like an auto, it's very autobiographical. And and you also you you talk about your dreams to meet Oprah, and you also talk about the the smackdown with Tim Ferriss. Right. Uh, I, I have to tell you that I have looked at Tim Ferriss as one benchmark and yardstick, Joe Rogan as another. Um, let's talk about Tim Ferriss in context of these five factors, and then I'd like to try and work through them very briefly yeah. um, and and almost restate or reframe um, what's happening with, with Corona TV. And I will mention what's interesting is the mentoring part is so interesting because truthfully, people ask me who my mentor, who my mentors are. I've never had any. I've always felt so alone. Yeah. And what I realize now is mentors don't always have to be there, right? And I'm not talking about the heavens, like in the jetpack heavens. Mm -hmm. Mentors could be you are a mentor to me, but also the idea of learning from our students, the idea of reaching down. It's not just helping the disadvantage. It's not just help to kind of right the wrongs, you know, of systemic, you know, injustices in the past. It's realizing by doing that, we actually help ourselves too because of that constancy of purpose. So it really, really is a self fulfilling prophecy. So so well done to you, my friend. But I would love to talk a little bit about Tim Ferriss and then we'll, we'll move through those five factors again. So, uh, so the, the, this, I, I took a lot of risks with this book. One of them, as you mentioned, is I tell a lot of my own stories. It's definitely the most autobiographical book I've ever written, maybe the most autograph, autobiographical book I ever will write. But I, I, I wanted to try to find a literary mechanism to bring, to tie the book together and sort of pull people through the book. And I was trying to find someone that created momentum against all odds. That's the subtitle of the book. And that's important because the world is stacked against us in so many ways. I think the overwhelming idea for every business and every marketer right now is how can we be heard? How can we possibly stand out? So I was looking for someone who's a great success and is like the most improbable person to ever be successful. And I came upon Tim Ferriss because I thought, what's his story? And when you look at his background, his first book came out when he was the age of 29 years old. Up until then, and I'm, I'm not saying anything that Tim hasn't said himself. Tim is, has been very transparent on huge stages and on his podcast about the struggles he's had. He said problems with depression. He tried to commit suicide. He said physical problems, psychological problems. He, when he was a, a young man, he was paralyzed by self-doubt, couldn't follow through with anything. Finally, he got to a point he was so burned out. He lost the love of his life, lost his business. He went, he just went to Europe and, and gave up on everything and traveled within Europe. And he thought there's got to be a better way. And as he was just sort of wandering through Europe, he started getting these ideas for a book. When he got back, he put together this outline for, for the book, his book, which became the New York Times bestseller, the four, what is it? The four hour work week. Right. It was rejected by 26 publishers. Now, if you look at this man when he was 29 years old, if you were the, the most risky gambler in the world, there is no way you would say 10 years later, he's hanging out with LeBron James, Hugh Jackman, and Oprah. There's no way. So it's like, what the hell happened? What happened here? what created this momentum? He did not have, he's a very bright guy, very hardworking guy, but he didn't have a million dollars in the bank. He, you know, what created it? So it was almost magical that if you look at exactly what happened in his career to create this completely unexpected success, it follows the five things in the book 100%. And he, you know, he, and he talks about these things very, 
very openly. So I compare in the book my, my trajectory versus his. I've had a wonderful career. I love every minute of what I do, but I'm not getting calls from Oprah. I cannot even get a return call from my plumber. So, you know, what is the, what were the decisions? What were his decisions? What were my decisions? How did it match up with these five factors? And where did we, you know, diverge? That's sort of the theme that, that takes people through the book. And it was a lot of fun. And, and so give us one of them. Just give us one example of what, what you know, uh, what was his in... And by the and by the way, uh, I will complete the story for you because I was because I was equally fascinated when he got the book deal. He said to the publisher, "You know the story, right?" He said to them, "I'm just curious. What was it about the manuscript and about the text and the idea and the angle that 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 made you approve this when the, all the others rejected it?" And they said, "Absolutely nothing." But we just looked at you and we and we thought this guy is going to give everything in his power to make this a success. They yeah. invested in the they invested in the man, in his case, the human, the person, rather than the idea, which is not inconsistent with how investors and VCs will often talk about startups. Right. A a absolutely. And I mean, he he worked very, very hard. And so I think one of the interesting things, uh, one of the most powerful things and effective things he did was once he had that momentum going, finally, he had an idea. Finally, he had an opportunity. Now, what was his scene? And uh, there was a, a, an interview, a profile done of Tim. I believe it was maybe by the New Yorker. And the, the journalist said, here was his opportunity. His generation didn't have a guru. And the timing for him was right because this was sort of the beginning of the hustle culture. And everybody's trying to be a, a tech superstar and they're working more and more hours and they're getting burned out. And all of a sudden, he comes out with this book, The 4-Hour Workweek. Well, sign me up. And by the way, the early reviews of his book were terrible. They were scolding. Uh, they said, this guy is just a self-promotional hack. But he was able to tap into this emotion. He was very focused on who his audience was. He knew his seam. His seam was, these people are working so hard. They're tired of it. They're sick of it. They're looking for an alternative, and that's where I'm going to zoom through this seam. And he was right. You and know, the timing was perfect. And and by and by the way, um, another example of one of those books that was rejected a whole bunch of times was was Harry Potter, yeah. uh, which right. then traded. You know, Harry Potter is the perfect example of cumulative advantage because. Yeah that momentum was so super strong at the beginning that the reality is that, you know, and, and by the way, um, he has another connection. You know, we always say the sequel is never as good as the original. It's because of cumulative advantage. And yet we continue to invest in the damn franchise. Yeah. Yeah. How can, right. how can a sequel ever be as good as the original? Um, but at the end of the day, it is cumulative advantage that carries That's the right. franchise through. Now That's I right. want to. I'm thinking as you talk. Um, I'm like shouting. I'm so excited. Um, uh, I'm thinking as as you talk that this is as much a book to a. Uh, this is as much a book to help us with career um, as it is also a book to help us through these uncertain times. You know, I love what the uh, Manif said. I feel less insane and obsessive compulsive listening to Mark. Um, you know, I started my startup in similar timeline of Corona TV and loving where we're going. So I guess we're doing this, we're doing this together. But you also talk about two things. And, and I think that certainly Tim talks to the first one, which is you, you introduced me now to the term of Gemba. Right. So talk a little bit about Gemba and then uh, and then uh, another new word that I've learned and is Ikigai. Ikigai. Yeah. So. 
here is one of the things that I think are, is just so eye-opening about this book. And it's also, this is a book of hope because there is nothing in this book that's not doable by anyone. It's not accessible to anyone. It doesn't require money or skills or, or really, you just have to be aware of how the world works and how the world creates momentum. And one of the things that we have to think about is, is that initial advantage where these doors are opening all around us all the time. We have these ideas. And, and so what I'm suggesting here is how can we put ourselves in places where we get these ideas? And part of this idea is Gemba. So I used to work for a big manufacturing company and we were really into the Toyota production system. And this idea of Gemba was, was essential. What they taught us, and this came from uh, the Japanese, is that if you really want to learn experience and get inspired, you have got to physically go there. You have to look around, talk to people, experience it, because things will come together for you that you never understood before. So I have examples in the book. There, there have been a lot of uh, uh, Starbucks was started this way. Home Depot was started this way. Uh, it, it's not some big strategy. It's just people saw, they were walking around, saw something that didn't make sense, and it started you know, an entire company. And by the way, and by the way, it's what Tim Ferriss did. He meticulously accounted for every success and generally failure Yes. So that he could, he observed and he learned. Well, in the time we have, I just, I also wanted to touch on, in addition to Gemba, is this concept of Ikigai. Yes. And, and you've obviously, I'm sure, seen this. This is an amazing chart uh, or, or Venn diagram, right? Passion, mission, vocation, and profession. What you're good at, what you love, uh, what the world needs, and what you can be paid for that ultimately finds this beautiful sweet spot. Well, and this this is sort of like the the kicker in the book and the kicker in the whole book. So I kind of have this made up race between Tim Ferriss and I, because I wrote a book with an original idea. I went through a seam. I wrote the first book on influencer marketing. I was the first one there. I could have created the first influencer marketing agency. I could be the world expert on influencer marketing. I had no interest in it. I would have been bored out of my mind. That's how Ikigai shows up because that wasn't what I wanted in my life. I didn't want to create an agency. I wanted to spend, I wanted to have free time to go take a hike, to go play tennis with my wife, to go you know, kayaking on the lake. I did not have the, the, the vision and the energy to pursue something like that. What drives me is learning new things. I reinvent myself every three to four years. It would have been death for me to focus on one thing, and that's where I fell off. It's this idea of constancy of purpose. What did Tim Ferriss do? What was his next book? The Four Hour Body. What was the next book? The Four Hour Chef. He cre that's he kept the momentum going. He created this franchise, right? He was consistent, and I had I just didn't want that. I wrote Return on Influence because it was an intellectual challenge. It was absolutely fascinating to me. But once it was over, I was on to the new thing. I made a decision to stop my momentum. And it was a good decision for me because it was better for my life. So that's how Ikigai, it has, it, you know, it, whatever happens with your momentum, it has to fit your, your lifestyle. I can't hear you. Oh, I, you know, I, I always mute. And when I mute, I always forget to unmute. Um, and it's weird because I've got this wonderful, you know, this wonderful, uh, you know, bi big ass mic and, uh, and it doesn't pick up the dog barking, but for some reason I feel sensitive about it and I never forget to, uh, to uh, so it's, I'm trying to be considerate. And in the end, I always mess up. Um, but, uh, but in, but enough about my troubles uh, and, and struggles. Here, here's what I wanted to say is we're going to continue this conversation 
uh, in Clubhouse because we're almost at the top of the hour. Uh, we we will uh, I'll open the room in just a couple of minutes uh, from now. Uh, Mark, we will talk about a bunch of things in the room. Uh, we will talk about this amazing post uh, that you wrote. Uh, amazing post, ten human centered marketing examples. But really, this has been uh, one of your passions at the moment. Speaking of passion, this idea of it's not just cumulative advantage. It, it is this idea of being this force for, you know, to help other people make it through these tough times through this pandemic, but specifically this idea of humanizing corporations, brands, ourselves, our lives, our interactions, especially amidst the sea of and this cacophony of technology that that dehumanizes us, you know, influencer marketing that creates these unfair imbalances, etc. So you have been this force for good uh, as you break through the clouds in your jetpack um, and, and help us uh, see the fact that, as I said, there is hope uh, to break some of these negative uh, cycles. So we will go and, and do that. I have pasted uh, uh, the Amazon link to Cumulative Advantage or just go and type Cumulative Advantage or Mark Schaefer into Amazon. Uh, I cannot wait, as I said to Lodro yesterday, for you to write the 10th book so you can come in again. But guess what? You don't need to write a book to come in and hang out uh, on Corona TV. Uh, this has been Mark Schaefer, the author of Cumulative Advantage. Uh, he also has a day job. Um, he is at B Square Media, and you can find out more about the company at B. In fact, you were just forming the company, or not forming, you just joined the yeah, company yeah. when you came on last time. It's bsquared.media. You can connect with Mark on LinkedIn, uh, on Instagram, uh, on Twitter, on Clubhouse, no doubt. But you know what? The best way to do it right now is to buy this book because you really do get a piece of Mark, a very personal piece of Mark. These stories, whether it's Gemba and Ikigai and Tim Ferriss, you can see how it's almost a little bit like Forrest Gump, right? All of these moments in your life have come together to weave and tell this really, really amazing story. Uh, so, Mark, thank you for coming in. We will go uh, to uh, Clubhouse now. And you know, in fact, I don't even know if Chuck Norris was on the show when you were on. Do you remember Chuck Norris on the show when you were on? Yes, 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 yes. Did he tell you you were Chuck Norris approved? Yes. Well, he's about to do it again. You are Chuck Norris approved. There you go. Let's go to Clubhouse. Thank you, Mark, and good luck. Thanks, to everyone. Everyone. The book. Thank you for watching Corona TV with your host, multiple author and global keynote speaker, Joseph Jaffe. Corona TV is the show about hope, positivity, optimism, and if there's time left over, a little bit of marketing. The after show on Zoom starts right now at bit.ly slash Corona TV after show. If you like the show, tell a friend or two. Please subscribe to the show at coronatv.show. And if you want to get inside news, previews of upcoming guests, and much more, text Corona TV to 66866 or visit josephjaffe.com slash subscribe to sign up for the show's newsletter. And despite the best ministrations of your wife, you still look ugly. <laughs>